I'm here with Destiny from the Chiefs. Dude, ooh, shake it off, shake it off, it's done. How are you feeling? Uh, yeah, a bit close for my comfort, to be honest. Uh, bit of a rough early game, but just proud of the boys for recovering and bouncing back. Yeah, what happened early game there? Because it, it was looking like it could go very wrong very fast. Uh, I think we, like, for me, I think I just stood up too far and I got caught. And then, um, yeah, we, we were just losing the game. And then we're just, like, we outscale. We just got to play our game, you know, mm -hmm. play around what we want to do. And eventually they did the Baron and we just punished them for it. And then you have made it through to the finals tomorrow. Obviously, there's a few more games for O's to play today. Uh, in terms of the mentality for the region, uh, how do you feel knowing you're in the finals, but also you've got Japan's fate riding on shoulders uh, for that <laughs> last game? Uh, it feels good. Like, this is the first event that O's has actually, like, dominated. Like, like, we're the only team here that has, in O's, that has lost. So, yeah. like, now I I feel like I've let down the region. But, um, yeah, it feels good. Like, I think we should win this event if we keep playing like we are. Mm -hmm. And day day one, O's good. Day two, no choke. So, O's is doing good. We're doing good, guys. Fantastic. Well, I hope you guys can keep it up. And I'll see you guys after the highlights. Swiper is on the back. A three-man knock-up into a two-man last breath. Rio is somehow alive. That's going to be one for Chiefs. Rocky gets locked up and locked down. Ray's flashes forward. Rude Prison gets the kill. That's what we wanted. The one oh, still looking. Swiper flash. Two-man head for Pulverize. It's a double kill for the Rise. And Chiefs, they are going forward. Ryo is here. He's going in. No, does not get the steal. And that's going to be the knock-up. Oh. Massive Yasuo yes, ultimate just straight through them. Chiefs find themselves the first kill. It's going to be a two. Everyone on Ascension is falling apart. It's starting to die. And it's a four for one for the Chiefs. In comes the damage. Chiefs start to fall apart, but it looks like Ascension are pumping it out. Or pop they go to Ascension. X marks the spot. It's a double kill for the Pike. He's Ray's still going. Four. A two man talk is a little bit wide as the Justice Punk connects onto Fabip. He's going to work it through, but Ray's gets a triple kill. Ray's is going to find himself a quadra kill. And at 32 minutes, they have found their opening. They have found themselves a game. And they have kept LJL in the runnings. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Chiefs doing Chiefs things. We talk about the Chiefs' aggression all the time, Hip Rain, but there, while Rocky at the first half, it was absolutely dominant in the second. Completely dominant, and I mean, this is just the OPL style. You know, you maybe fall a little bit behind in the early game, but then you just come alive in that late game, and you just brawl and fight until you win. And uh, in my interview with Destiny, he was talking about the fact that he felt like he was getting caught out of position early game. That led to a bit of the bumpy start for them. But then his engages in the second half of that game, that's something regions are going to have to look out for tomorrow. I mean, yeah, Royoma looks great, but it all comes off the back of Destiny. And that's why we talked about him. That's why we, you did your interview with him, because a great Yasuo is always set up by a great Alistair. I know that's a bit of a broad statement, but he looked absolutely great in that game. And... I mean, this is the thing about Destiny. If you give him these engaged supports, we've seen him on Rakan, now we've seen him on the Alistair, he just makes it work for his team. My favorite part of that game was about 18 minutes, the uh, mid game uh, in mid lane team fight. Uh, it's going the way of the Chiefs. They just dive in under the tower and just cross their fingers and hope for the best. I'm watching the game with Ejem and he just yells out, this is so Chiefs. And it just <laughs> absolutely was, it was a joy to watch. Up next, we've got Legacy versus Mineski. Who are you tipping? I mean, it's really hard to call because both of these teams have only played twice at this tournament, so we haven't seen too much from them. Last time we saw Maneski, they played that funnel strat, and it's the only one we've seen at the tournament, so maybe we'll see it again. Mm -hmm. Maybe Legacy just ban it out, don't want to deal with the Kaiser, don't want to deal with like, the Zyra Khan super combo either. So it's quite hard to call. I think if you're a fan of the LJL, and I like my storylines, so I'm obviously going to go for Legacy. Yeah, I am too, and I think no one wants this game to start more than the Japanese region, so let's throw it over to the caster's desk with Rusty, EJ and Spawn. Thanks so much, Nick. I am Jake Spawn Tiberi. Joining me are two X Legacy Pro players in Bryce <laughs> Egypt Paul, as well as Zach Rusty Pie. He's on to us. He is, I absolutely. Uh, this game means a lot because Legacy would be really looking forward to getting back on Summoner's Rift after a great performance yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Both these teams, uh, we have been talking about, they've only played one map each, and they both have those victories. So definitely coming in here, we're going to see who the better region is. Yeah, absolutely. And the end result of this game means that of the third seeds, we have a definitive best team. It's not a three-way tie between them by any means. They both beat Unsold Stuff Gaming. And the interesting thing about that to me is Unsold Stuff Gaming just didn't look that great. So this will be the first real test. Yeah, one of the teams that did not look all that confident, confident coming in. However, let's go through the lineups 
on the blue side, it's going to be Legacy Esports. Mimic is their top laner only in the jungle. Claire, their superstar, Melburnian mid laner, Raid <laughs> and Decoy are their AD carry and support. And of course, Lucio Soulstrike Park is their coach. And I want to start with Lucio because I think this is one of the guys that lets his players have control at certain parts. You know, the Poppy into Ord mm -hmm. matchup is something that Mimic loves. Yep. Gave it to him last game and he really stood out. And it was this legacy lineup that proved to me like so much about that matchup. I love the Poppy into Ord. You can just cancel everything he wants to do. The dashes, the ultimate, you just sit there with the Poppy Copter, you knock him away and there's nothing he can do. Yeah, fantastic stuff from the big brain, of course, drafting things that Mimic likes to play like you mentioned, but also having a big plan of his own soul strikes. He always comes in very well prepared. Yeah, it certainly does. The other member of the team that both of you guys know very well has been around Luciani for a very long time is Claire had a standout performance in their first game. Yeah, his Zoe was popping off, and I love that Legacy played to the classic Legacy style. Their bottom lane played that defensive. They played through the solo lanes, and you really saw like the fruits of that labor. You really saw them pro uh, propel themselves to victory. And I do wonder in this game if they get punished through the bottom lane because mm -hmm. they played super defensively. But if you watch that Legacy game, you feel like, well, if they're going to be topside focused. Why not pick a winning bottom lane and try and poke down what was just an Ezreal holding on and farming with Q? Well, their opponent that will hope to do that is going to be Mineski from Southeast Asia. Of course, Kaigu in the top lane. Jun, their jungler. Exo Sen, their superstar mid laner. Gary and Hermes are their AD carry and support. And I want to start with good guy Gary down there in the bottom lane. <laughs> the funnel for the funnel comp and it was able to put on an absolute clinic against Unsold Stuff Gaming. And he was the confident player at that on that Kaiser. He was dashing in very early, even before the Lulu Ultimates or the Morgana Spell Shield sometime, but still navigated it incredibly well. Knows how to play when he's got a team to support him. And it wasn't even confidence just from the AD carry. That was a very defensive start to the final composition. They hit 20 minutes and just started the Baron immediately, completely turning the tide of the game and... It was just, just coming out of nowhere, and they just won the game on the spot. And as you said, whilst this is Southeast Asia versus Oceania, this is also battle for some bragging rights amongst the third seed. USG going 0-2 means that one of these teams will be undefeated. One of these teams will have to unfortunately lose already into Champion Select. It is Alistar and Morgana, Morgana taken away. And it's pretty interesting in terms of the general context of the tournament. We've talked so much about how it was so hard for the LJL and the OPL teams to scout teams like Mineski from SEA, and all we've seen from them is that funnel composition, that niche play style, whereas yeah. Legacy have shown the classic Legacy style, so there's a bit of a mismatch in what these two teams have shown on the competitive And stage. it's interesting already through this draft that Mineski are banding away what worked for Legacy, mm -hmm. and Legacy are banding away the exact same thing. And I will always say, when it comes to a final composition, that Morgana is the number one must ban because no one else has a spell shield, yep. whereas there are supplements in other positions. Yeah, certainly can be the case. Kaiser as well as Ezreal banned away. And I'm just going to give the rest of the world a little bit of a hint against the Oceanic lineups. Most of the teams run engaged through their support position. Mm -hmm. Ban Rakan, ban Alistar seems to be a way that a lot of teams in the OPL can find success. Yeah, and that's what exactly has been done here, Mineski. Banning those two ones away. It's going to leave us in an interesting position where we've seen so much Nocturne, so much Talia priority in terms of the ban phase. Legacy obviously much more worried about the spooky ghost that is in the Nocturne, so yeah, that Talia one's going to hit up. the bench. So Talia is always an option, and at the Ooh. same time, this is something that Claire played in his first game on the Rift as that Zoe, but Talia still stands, and I'm curious to see if the priority goes to jungle now. But Lucian Braum is up and available. Legacy is that team that want to play through the solo lanes, but when this combination is up and available, they just completely flip the script. So Lucian lock in. I expect Decoy to go back to his traditional one trick when he came onto the pro scene. He was that Braum one trick before he expanded his pool, it and he's hate now you getting that pick. So here. much for calling him a one trick of Braum. He was has publicly said that he doesn't enjoy playing the champion, even though it is so strong. Any they more. do lock it in. <laughs> You're really passionate about this, Egypt. It, it was true, you know. It's like coming that's, from the Lulu one that, that is how a that lot of pro super. players break into the scene, right? Like you have your one, your one champion. You get to super high elo, and then you expand when you get yeah, to the absolutely. competitive level. And that's what he's seen. He has a big champion pool, plays a lot of things, but going back to that default, that safety is uh, pretty important on a stage like this. It certainly is. They most likely will be laning up against Swain, a champion that has done a good job of shutting down these mid-range duos in the bottom lane, such as Lucian Braum. Yeah, certainly. Swain going to be a very big threat down there. Of course, we haven't seen the support that's coupled with it. Often has crowd control, but with Rakan and Alistar banned by Mineski, makes you wonder, will they go to, like, say, the Pike? Yeah. And that's the thing. The Pike last game was super interesting. That interaction, the ability to hit them with the Harpoon and then instantly rip them back before having to burn Swainy. I feel like was super potent, despite Pike not having a super high win rate this tournament, hasn't had a whole lot of success. Uh, 
in the straight 2v2 has looked pretty good. It's going to be Graves the last pick up this one going towards only most likely. So prioritizing that good tempo jungle matchup. Yeah, definitely. So the Graves pretty good through the jungle. Also now having two ranged physical damage dealers makes you wonder what Claire will play in the middle lane. Something heavy in the magic damage is what I would like to see from them. I know he can play the likes of the Cassiopeia very well. Not to mention they've already got two double auto attackers with the Brawn pickup. It's a pretty well-rounded composition already. I would expect Karma to come out from Claire, to be honest. Uh, double auto attackers. He is a big uh, Karma player. Also allows for some strength to go over into Mimic's hands. I know I'm supposed to be the play-by-play -play caster in this yeah, right. so like they also banned away Rise. Not to mention, we expect the Karma in this sort of composition to actually go the Art and Sensor build, not go for the Ludens, not go for the Sork Boots straight off the bat. Go for that more defensive Athene's Art and buff up the rest of your teammates. And Darius banned away from Kaigo up in the top lane. Potentially, Mimic wants to run a tank up there, something like the Orn, something like the Mundo. Yeah, I definitely expect a tank to be seen. Now, something that has ranged and engaged to me would be bigger than anything else, so that's why Orn may stand up as a big deal, and I'm surprised that if Mineski don't ban that one. However, you've mentioned mid lane champions from Claire. That's a different one. Certainly is. Haven't seen him play it for a while, but yeah. Galio going to be taking off Summoner's Rift. Yeah, they don't really have a lot of options in terms of getting Galio into a team fight. You normally see a pair with something like the Rakan, something like the Camille. Of course, Camille is still up and available, but it's just going to be a big fat tank locked in for Mimic so far. Mundo will be going where he pleases Ooh. on Summoner's Rift. Once again, Aatrox being hovered right now, Rusty giggling. I mean, Mundo just leaves himself open to counter picks that we've seen through this tournament. No Mundo's at a good time hey. against Aatrox. No surprise that can be considered unlocked. And gentlemen, he is not that bad. <laughs> if you get three lock-ins at an inter-regional tournament, you can't be that bad. He hasn't been long. He has not been around for oh, long. Oh, please lock this in. It's been sorely missing through this entire tournament. And they do. It all sticks. Why has it been missing, Rusty? Give me some more than that. I don't know why it's been missing, Spawn, but I can tell you that it's a strong champion and should be seen more. It has a lot of lane pressure. Working with the Swain, it's a point-and-click crowd control. Morgana is still banned by Legacy as well, which is something that even adds more. And it's not even bad into Morgana, which has the spell shield. And that's the thing. I feel like this bottom lane is going to be super volatile, because if the Fiddlesticks can start setting things up with the Swain, I feel like they can run over the matchup. But if Lucian Braum ever gets ahead, the Skirmish potential can... Uh, Run completely amok and is very hard to deal with, so have to track that one going into the early game. Very tanky bottom lane because Fiddlesticks now running Aftershock. Yep. And it's dangerous for the Lucian to now dash in because if you get feared, ripped back, you're going to be in melee range of a Swain with no tools. It is going to be the counter pick in LeBlanc locked in in the mid lane. We've been talking about it all tournament long, I believe. This is the first yep. LeBlanc Zoe matchup. Claire taking more of a historical look at Summoner's Rift as he locks in an Assassin. We've seen more of the Assassins like the Aurelia into the Zoe. We've seen some people trying to just go blow for blow and scale it out with something like a Galio, but as you mentioned, it will be the first LeBlanc. And you know, I'm just looking at Legacy's composition and I'm really struggling to work out what the cohesion truly is besides damage everywhere. There's Kill people. Yeah, yep. it's, it's pretty much what it's going to be, right? But Lucian running the cleanse first and foremost with an Ignite support, so no heal against Exhaust Ignite. Mm -hmm. Their opponent's looking to kill them early, looking to still get that damage out themselves. Well, yeah, coaches will shake hands. As you see the trophy for Rift Rivals on your screen right now, that is what they're playing for. Oceania still looking to continue this great run. Only the Chiefs have lost a game. Everyone else within the region undefeated and Legacy looking to stay that way, of course. Mineski also haven't dropped a game as yep. well from the Southeast Asian region, looking to get them back on track. Sample size, Seg. Sample size. They're both 1-0, but that is 100% win rate. They've only been able to play one yep. game. It's not like you can ask them to win more. Yep. Yeah. And they only play two at the tournament because they are the third seeds, whereas first and second play against each other. Well, we are about to get onto Summoner's Rift. It is game three of day number three here at Rift Rivals Pacific Rift, and it is going to be... Oceania's Legacy taking on the Southeast Asian Tour, Mineski. Legacy currently on your red side, Mineski on your blue side. What are we looking to see here early game? Well, I think it's super interesting in terms of Mineski coming into game um, match day three, right? They skipped out on yesterday. They played day number one. They played that final composition. And mm -hmm. we've been talking about earlier on in the tournament, nerves coming back on stage. Of course, they got their first game in and then had a big break. They would have had time to watch everyone, specifically Legacy, play yesterday and then prepare and have time to then bring that on to day number three. What do you do as a player? Do you go out and see sites? Do you have no. a couple of... 
you know? Bots. Sodas? Or yeah, do you, sodas, do, yeah. Do you, play, do you play solo queue? You like, tried what to, do you do? You tried to get yourself out of that one. Solo queue, yes. Like you, you, A lot of teams look for scrims. They watch a lot of the VODs, you know, like you want to watch specifically the teams that you're playing against tomorrow. It's not super relevant for Mineski to watch Chiefs, watch Diawals. They do watch Legacy's game, and then I would expect them to try and just fit scrims around that. I'd be curious to know if the coaches, of course, from the regions helped one another. If you have a lot of reliance, as an example, Mineski on this day needing to win, all of Southeast Asia needing to win, did the teams group together, the coaches band together, and help one another improve? Because it's always a little bit bittersweet helping your own region improve when you go back to play against them later on. Yeah, that's the thing. But as you get to the sticky end of the tournament, it becomes all that more important. It becomes less about the individual teams and more about the region. So the later you go, the more cohesion I expect between all the three regions. And Hummers, a man after my own heart, has taken Comet into the bottom lane. Get rid of all these Aftershock supports. Oh. Instead, just try and peg birds at people until they're chipped out of lane. Are you sure on that one, Egypt? Uh, it's pretty dangerous against the Lucian Brawl. Yes, this is a, a very aggressive choice. We talked about the volatili volatility there. If they can get ahead, sure. They have the combat advantage in terms of the exhaust versus the claims and the ignite, but so what's they fall behind. So interesting about that lane in that 2v2 is that Raid has got the cleanse. So without the Aftershock bonus resistances, if Raid is able to just cleanse out of it and the Q connects, I think Hamas just dies. It kind of gives you that one opportunity to be the dash forward proactive Lucian, right? You can just dash forward, cop a fear to the face, and if you cleanse that one immediately, Braum dashes to you, suddenly you have extra priority. You can keep walking forwards, keep pressuring in the matchup. But no sustain. Yep, a little bit of sustain in Swain's kit as he rips your soul out. A lot in the Fiddlesticks kit. And if he does max E, the crows, you just throw crows at people. What a brilliant play style. And talking about the crows, Raid has already level two burnt his potion. But uh -oh. only into the bottom lane, they go good fear away. Hamas will have to burn the flash. However, drags oh. decoy back into turret. We'll take a cheeky shot. But that was super nice from Decoy. Only had lost a bit of health, and he jumps in front of the Graves to save him. Means it only keeps his flash. Of course, the risk there is that Braum used his own, but only saves some health as well, just in case things like this happen. But up. we've constantly been talking about the volatility of this bot lane. That's double flashes burnt from the lineup of Mineski. Fiddlesticks, no dash, has sustained. Swain has sustained as well, but no dash. It uh, can only go downhill for Mineski's bottom lane from here. And yeah. somehow top lane's going real downhill as well for Legacy, as Mimic is on no health he just stuck underneath dove, his turret. Actually. I think he stopped his recall because Talia was spotted by the scrying orb that only threw, but at the same time, he's on cleaver duty and he's going to get zoned away. Ooh, the fact that he's actually left the turret Ooh, here, Mimic might be in a, lot of there, in a lot of trouble. As you mentioned, does the Dark and Blade come up and available? Little knock-up. Second one forces the flash, and Kaigu taking over top lane. Mimic so far behind already. The fact that he leaves the turret means that Kaigu doesn't even have to trade HP with that turret to dive him, so no summoner burnt from the Aatrox, and Mimic loses everything. Yeah, it's really unsettling to see that the recall was cancelled, whether that was threat from Kaigu or not. The end result is that Mimic has to use both summoner spells instead of just one. Maybe looking for a couple of extra CS, just that little bit extra gold for a better recall, not going to be seen at all. Yeah, meanwhile, mid lane, every summoner spell, well, not everyone, but the two flashes, Ignites are still available, have been used. There's uh, two sitting on the floor There's there. There's just a know? random so, barrier on the ground. Yeah. Zoe, uh, oh no, okay, one of them's a barrier. I thought that was double flash, you know. Zoe has access, but none of her own. Barrier kind of looks like a failed flash when it's on the ground, like a person falling. He fell over. Like, <laughs> he teleported like a meter and then just fell flat in his face. Oh, this is going to be a face check Ooh. out of Claire. Will be able to get away. Running low on mana, however, this is going to be a frozen wave. That was a sick reaction time from Claire, though, being able to distort himself to safety. Meanwhile, right. Finisticks is mid lane. We'll get hit by the Super Soaker as well. Claire goes down. First blood for Hermes. And the collapse from all sides. Fiddlesticks, Flashless, just walks up the river, has the CC, and then the Claire, so the silence, so Claire cannot dash away. He also has a Claire now yeah. as well. Gets to take him home. Only trying to help keep this wave neutral. Jun and Exosen trying to push it in. Yeah, great little push and reset here for the side of Mineski after an early and strong first kill. In the hands of the Fiddlesticks is not always the best thing, but he didn't start... Actually, he did start with the stopwatch, so he's sitting real pretty on going towards that zone as soon as possible. I feel like if you're playing the Comet Fiddlesticks rather than the Aftershock, like if you're getting ahead, that bodes so well for your laning phase. Uh, much more so than the tankier variant. Oh, uh, actually oh, over oh. the wall, that's going to be only caught out as well. XSN didn't go back to base. What? Only just got put to sleep, had the flash, and just immediately died. Perhaps just disrespecting that Exorcine would stay around. 
And he had a pretty big lead already. He was sitting on like 30-something CS to about 18 of the Talia. We've seen so many times that a Talia that falls behind early can really struggle to make an impact on the game. And uh, Grave scales so incredibly well, so... He was in a power position, but lost it all. Yeah, meanwhile, top lane, you can see Mimic gets ripped back and will eventually fall down. Kaigu burns the flash. Starts early from Mimic, of course, using the flash at level four, and now he's able to go down just super clean from the Mineski side. This third seed from Southeast Asia is starting to show up something big, and they're looking very good. And this is just standard League of Legends. This is no funnel, and they're just taking to Legacy with their strengths. They're going to have to rely on their bottom lane if this... Uh, no flash Track on Fiddle. Yeah, Fiddle will eventually be stunned underneath the turret. Flash forward from only. We'll get ripped back, however. Now, Gary, under fire, will just re uh, back away. Yeah, good little play there from Mineski, uh, rather from Legacy onto Mineski's support, who used the flash in the middle lane, was trying to make those plays. So they do react nicely, but they still lose those first things. And with how well Mineski are playing right now, I have a strange question for you. But we're about to go into blind relay if they win this game. Mm -hmm. How bold is it to play your third seed a couple of times as opposed to potentially your second or your first seed? Because that's the thing, right? You can only play one seed. Oh, only, only. Oh. only just going to get blown up. Good night. In the same position he found himself before, that's a Raptor camp baiting him to his death. But if I'm not mistaken, you can only play a single team twice. They can't play more so than that. Two of your teams, uh, yeah, a single team twice. Yep. So, but you get to play two teams twice if it goes to all five games. Every team has to play in the first three. Yep. But naturally, you would kind of expect the higher seeds to get more games, but Mineski absolutely making their case for more games in that blind reload. Yes, the, the context is important here. Is, is Legacy as good as Direwolves or Chiefs, you know? And does it actually make the top Southeast Asian teams look bad when really OPL is good? We don't know. So that's a question that Southeast Asia would have to answer if they win this one. I guess that is super interesting because the third seeds only play against each other as uh, Mimic. He's Might in just some be trouble. in more Again, trouble. Oh, ulti Lord. will come out of Kaigu. Mimic's ulti is about to expire. And Mimic is just running around in circles. He's not going anywhere he wants. He'll eventually fall down. Kaigu is massive. And I asked you for a prediction last time Aatrox was played, Jake. And you said 8-2. Yeah. He's now 2-0, but that's a double CS lead in the top lane. What's, What's the what prediction score? for this one? What scoreline score makes Aatrox OP? I don't know. <laughs> I honestly can't answer that question anymore. But I think that this one will very quickly get out of control. As you mentioned, 30 CS up, a couple of kills. If he doesn't get above six kills, I will personally be disappointed. Okay. I'm glad we I'm glad we got it on on real on film, you know? <laughs> Just needed the number to be spoken There's about. There's a sound bite. I'm yeah. alright, I'll go seven, three, like nine. I reckon this is gonna be a fairly bloody game. Okay. If anyone's going to die, it would be the Aatrox as well. The rest of the team kind of pokey. You know what? Fiddles would have well. I take that back. There's two. Mimic, once again going forward, will get hit by that cheeky W and get dragged back to the center of it. And I'm interested to see if Legacy or even Mineski on the bot side of the map do either either of them opt in to a lane swap, right? Like we're approaching the 10 minute mark. First items are uh, being built slowly. That's a Cutlass picked up by the Lucian. You have the Catalyst for the Swain. And yeah. the top side of the map for Legacy is a huge hole, but I feel like on the other side of the map, Mineski, their bottom line is just constantly being shoved in. Every time only goes down there, it's disaster. Yeah, you know, for me, if I was Legacy, I'd just hard commit to the bottom lane and break the turret first. Bring only down as soon as possible. Maybe even threaten the teleport from Mimic and just commit to what's working for you. If you can even get a stopwatch from Hamez or a flash from the fiddle six as he's cresting over to six, it'll do wonders for when he tries to gank and inevitably gets those boots of mobility to roam around. Because the thought process harkens back to the actual lane swap meta where you look at the top laners and you're like, okay, it's a pure tank versus a bruiser. The bruiser relies on getting gold much more often there, right? Like the tank can survive on a budget economy, so Legacy would be much happier kind of breaking open the game and and setting Mimic behind the yep. gold curve of the entire game relative to his opponent in combat. However, again, only, only going to be caught. Recalling will just be able to dash away. That will be Exosense sitting his face into there. But Rahamez now, They're he's level looking. Six. He's going to go for the dive here, you would expect. Stopwatch Rose. available. That's Crowstorm in. Once again, they just blow up Decoy and will get out scot-free. Very simple stuff here from Mineski. Executing, knowing full well that only had to back away, even the dash used. And there was no vision from Legacy even after that fact. So stuck under the turret, they die. And the target selection as well, going onto the Braum. It's not the member in the bottom lane that has that cleanse. So now in a one versus two, Raid trying to defend the turret, but Claire. Uh -oh. Hello, goodbye. Is just dead. Didn't use flash there either, so maybe got hit by a bubble, don't know. Uh -huh. Potentially bubble into flick. Something like that, the damage potential out of these two 
Mage is in the middle lane for Mineski. Pretty damn high. Meanwhile, top lane, at least Mimic can farm now, or can he? Or maybe I spoke too early. Not too, not too well. <laughs> He's absolutely He's on struggle street. <laughs> He's <looks laughs> having a bad day. Every time we go mid, mid's dead. And if we look at top lane, and Aatrox is just bodying in the 1v1, 35 ahead. We'll bubble? see how Claire dies. Yeah, it was a bubble, and then it's just nice follow-up. Had himself a raid smite, so uh, cheeky little bit of extra damage. Jun comes in the back end of the fight. No flick there, no pebbles, just threw a bunch of rocks, and they pick up an easy kill onto the block. And this is a whole map right now, just falling apart for Legacy. They're not winning anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even their counter pick of the LeBlanc is 0 2 0 versus a 2 0 3 Zoe. And I guess for Claire, the painful thing is, is it only gave away the first two, two kills to the Zoe. And that's the thing, their strong points have been falling down. That swing in the bottom side where Lucian and Brom actually get dove. Look how low the turret is on the yeah. minibat. That's incredibly low. So much chunk. That's a, a breath away from falling down. Rift Herald even is going to be used to break top turret. Yeah, I mean, bottom lane should be the one that has kill thread. Looking! Hamez gets flashed on decoy now coming in. However, that is going to be the stopwatch used. Eventually should fall down. That is a first kill for Claire, but now the fight continues. And oh, it is going oh. to be Kaigu in behind only Claire. Trying to go over the wall. Flashes in and this is going to be only definitely falling down. Stuck underneath the turret. That's going to be Jun picking up the kill. And Mineski are rolling. Yeah, they don't get Claire, of course. That was just the clone, and Exosense still looking for more, perhaps to find the kill. Claire about to face check. Oh, is it? I don't know. Gets a ward, I mean, and now feels reveal. safe. That's not oh. a good area, however. Good distortion. Exosense will flash forward. That was, of course, a W flash. Second turret will go down. Doesn't have one of his own, but once again, Legacy, their strong points consistently falling down. They looked for that pick, but the TP comes out of Kaigu. They get punished in the two for one. Bubble. Not going to lead to all that much. You can see that Claire continually looking for a teleport was available, but no counter punch play is on the cards. There are some things in this game that you can bring it back to draft that really scare me from the legacy side. I think that that Mundo personally could be the likes of an Orn that I don't think we saw in the pick ban at all. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned they wanted some ranged engage. Well, the composition starts to lack in that. And when the Mundo's behind, he needs levels to scale up, he needs items to still scale up, and he'll probably stay in that position. And it's almost a little bit of disrespect in terms of the tournament meta. We talk about meta as a very general thing that applies region to region, but in these small, like, multi-day events, a meta in the tournament seems to emerge, and we've seen already in just a few Aatrox games his success into the Mundo matchup. So the fact that Mimic just gets blinded that Dr. Mundo into Kaigu, who last yeah. game played Renekton, who plays those lane bullies, it's not all that surprising cool. to me that he can whip out the Aatrox. And Claire just saw his life flash before his eyes. If that Paddle Star had a landed, Bubble would have followed. And you can see Hermes is just around here, looking to bait Claire in. Is Exosense. Claire doesn't even choose to trade with the Zoe there, just focusing on the minion wave and is completely locked in his lane now that the outer turret has fallen, yep. dealing with minions. And at the same time, conversely, Exocent is free to move wherever he would please. And then remember, they've got a Fiddlesticks, they've got a Talia. Their objective control, if they have the vision, they just win. You yeah, can't face check. It's so hard for Legacy to actually set up here. Hammer's once again sitting in a pink watered bush and Legacy have to play so defensive. LeBlanc, one of those champions that... Ooh, oh, Claire! No. You want that freedom to roam around the map, and you see what's happening. Him just trying to wave clear against the Zoe. She gets the free farm wage only. Only flashes forward. That's a good ultimate. Very However, nice. great flick coming out of June. We'll get into safety. Hammer's going over oh. the wall. And Gary is in there as Swain. He is a huge bird. Will be able to explode eventually. However, sticking in the crow form for a very long time oh, goes golden is. as well. Flick is there. Decoy also should fall down. And this is Mineski. Absolutely smashing legacy. And across the board just looks really good for Mineski. Such a clean team fight. The communication as well from Gari saving the stopwatch for as long as possible, knowing that he's gonna tank. They get the team fight and it starts with Legacy wanting to go in. And that's the thing, they're just punishing Legacy for their greedy plays. Claire in the mid lane was on literally two HP, had to back away. All of a sudden, Legacy on the bottom side try to make a play onto the Talia, starts with a very nice flick. And they just get cleaned up underneath their turret and they lose even more. And this Gazza guy's all right. Yeah, Gary number one, pretty damn good. Off, bro. Certainly is. Uh, Sleepy Trouble Bubble lands. Claire has to get the heck out of dodge. Exosend will put some damage into decoy. Ooh. Claire goes back forward and might actually fall down. So much damage coming out of Exosend. Will go golden with that stopwatch. And now everyone else is here. Oh. Shut down for Claire. Yeah, you saw the idea there from Exosend, but he got completely played for the full once yep. decoy had found the mark and Claire goes back forwards. But we get to see this again. And this is Legacy 
making a play that they shouldn't be making on the wrong side of the map. The priority in the mid lane is way too much. As soon as they cannot get the pick onto Talia, Gary number one flashes over the wall. Huge Swain, he lives for so long, still has that stopwatch. And even on the backside off screen, Exosin lands the bubble onto Lucian, so there's nothing he can do either. And honestly, Jun just looks really clean on this Talia. Not just the flick at the start, but that second one at the end, diving the turret. They look like he's mastered the champion, and you're starting to see that play out. Yeah, and it looks like he's potentially going to go for a Rylize, maybe go towards some uh, penetration with uh, the Oblivion Orb as well. Both of them have the same build path. But something that MLXG used to do in the LPL when he was very far ahead on AP junglers, Rusty, was yeah, go Rylize as well as the AP jungle item because the slow off the bounce just becomes such great utility. Oh, honestly, it's it's massive. And if you are ahead, you don't need to go the most efficient damage dealing items. You can afford to go utility and help your team catch up to you through those team fights. So something that we may actually see from this Talia. Of course, he's got the challenging smite, so dealing extra damage as it stands. And this is a fun fiddle six game. When you get to hide around corners, <laughs> sweep out vision, kind of play incognito fiddle sticks, that's great. When you have to sit under turret, that sucks. When you're crow like when you're crow storming waves, when you're just flicking the E around trying to wave clear, it's uh no fun at all. But it's kinda like Blitzcrank. When you're ahead, you get to sit in a pink watered bush and giggle quietly to yourself. You're the scariest <laughs> member of the map whilst being a support. <laughs> So as we take a look at the gold, it is about a 5,000 gold lead right now for Maneski. 17 minutes in, certainly significant, but game nowhere near over just yet. Most of it held in the jungle position actually right now. That's a pretty big lead on the Talia. He's a big boy. Only started this game very well. He was up CS and got caught twice. That pesky Raptor camp. Yep. Man. The bane of his existence and then got dove under the, the turret bot side. So went wow. very quickly from hero to Pretty much zero right now, sitting at 1-4. Talia Wall gonna come in, run, Mimic, run! He gets caught between a rock and a hard place. Here comes Fiddle. And in comes Fiddle. That is so much damage, gets locked in the middle. Oh, Will get no. drove back, even after the flash. Kaigu can use the ultimate if he so pleases. And they say, get back here and chop down Mundo. The flash just a bit early there from the Mundo gets pulled back and such as Aatrox, it seems there's an interaction that Mimic's learned today. Maneski go bottom, they're gonna get a turret. And Legacy are trying to answer on the other side of the map, but once again, mid-priority in favor of the Zoe. So the answer coming from the OPL lineup is just so incredibly slow. This is an outer for an inner in terms of turret trade. And I feel like this is very simple from Mineski. They are just doing the next obvious thing. Yep. And Legacy are the ones trying to respond with something different. During the time where Dragon was taken, you saw Legacy on the top side of mid, hiding behind their, the lack of vision of Mineski because they don't need to go there. Kaigo goes in again, just misses that CC. Will have to flash away. However, now Claire, Sleepy Trouble Bubble lands and he gets a race. And this goal lead is just exploding right now, but with Claire gone, Lucian Chrome is up Ooh, and available. But that rip landing in into him. a flick. Big damage onto only Sleepy Trouble Bubble again. We'll put Decoy to sleep and they will continue this siege. Looks like they might be able to hold this one if they can just clear this way, but it's 20 seconds on Claire. You can see Mineski, they've committed. They really want to force this one. Not a lot of ulties on the lineup of Mineski, but Turret looks to be dead. Ooh, oh, Ray taking bubble. big damage. Sleepy Trouble Bubble again. Kaigu looking just for the CC. And you can see them continue to stream forward. Decoy takes a big chunk. Now the inhibitor under fire, but they should just back away. Claire is about to come back alive, but the inhibitor has already fallen down. Big power play from Mineski, honestly, just asserting themselves, particularly Gari with that Swain pressing R and saying, come at me, we're taking this in. And the timing couldn't be better. 30 seconds before Baron spawns, you take down mid side, a uh, mid lane inhib. That's a LeBlanc, it's not a wave clear mage. She doesn't want to be sitting there dealing with that. They're going to have to bring multiple members to shove that one out as We've talked about how Vision is so integral to a Fiddlesticks and this style of composition that Maneski have. If they can just set up pink wards around the Baron and mid lane will naturally push in for them, Legacy are going to have a tough time uh, contesting the Baron. And Hermes again though. potentially looking for the play. He's currently frozen in place, not moving. There, there he goes. goes. Charges it up, will oh. dive in. Claire will take some big damage. Sleepy Trouble Bubble there onto Decoy. Will go pop Ooh. Claire. Will just get out with his life. Now on the back line, Raid looking for a decoy. Under fire, Kaigu is just flapping his wings and only cannot run fast enough. Will flash over the wall. Kaigu will dash over and he's going to continue to look for it. That is a very quick AA Trox. And he is just not that bad. He will take him down. And that was the absolute max range fiddle ulti coming into play. There are three members dead by Legacy. 20 minutes on Baron spawn. Maneski make the power play. When you're losing the game, it's so hard to spot a fiddle sticks. You'll have no idea where he's going to be. And he hits the mark incredibly well with that guaranteed crowd control. And whilst he dies, 
the team succeed. And with that Baron, with now a 9,000 gold lead, the third seed from Southeast Asia is looking to secure their spot in the grand final. And people looking at this Maneski lineup, you know, first day coming in being like, they can play the funnel. USG didn't have an answer, but what does it look like when they play standard? Unfortunately for us, Legacy are the team to find out. I actually really like watching Maneski play. They yep, do not good. seem to have hesitation on those calls that are, you know, bold, but they're not overreaching. They're going for just the right amount and then pulling back as a unit. Yeah, and timing it well above all else, like that mid lane inhib play, knowing full well how long they had to make the play and using the exact amount of resources necessary to secure that objective when they find the chance. And once again, Bryce, it seems to be that top side of the map that's falling down for Legacy. We've seen this locally, that when the top side cannot perform, when they get set behind, Raiden Decoy just can't play themselves into the game. And there's a big difference between having the tools to carry and actually executing on that style, right? Like Mimic, you've seen when he gets ahead, can take over a game player in the same boat when he gets that lead, but Raiden Decoy have found oh. themselves in this situation multiple times, but not, not able to flex their muscles. See, uh, Hamez actually took all of his health from Claire there. Yep. Nice little combo, Rusty, but yeah, turret will still go down. It's very hard to play a AP support into a LeBlanc. Just in general, you're always going to be squishy and assassinated. And those 4v5s is sometimes all it takes. He's also barely trying to get his drain out on a minions, and Baron Buff yeah. is actually just killing the wave he wants to heal off. But if you're a Fiddlesticks with a Zonyas, your HP bar doesn't actually matter too much. And another turret is going to fall down. Jun will take some damage. Sleepy Trouble Bubble just misses there. Siege will continue. Talia Wall even used to try and deter Legacy from getting into the area, zoning them away. And it should just be gone. Yeah, it looks like it will be. Very nice rip back. Gary in the front line will go into Demonic Ascension. May fall down, but the rest of the team now in. Hamas will go golden. And Kaigo is here looking to take over the back of this team fight. Gets one kill. Make that a double. And it is only Claire and only left available. And I don't think they're going to be able to do it. Exo Sen flashing forward. Throws the Paddle Star into a creep, but turret number one already down. Turret number two will fall in. Jun will just go into the gold form, and Claire will get deleted off the map. And with that, they will turn their attention onto only, but really what they should be focusing on is Thursday because they have secured Southeast Asia's spot in Rift Rivals Grand Final. And at the end of that game, that was a four versus five. Aatrox still sitting on the other side of the map, pressuring the bot lane. Legacy, they try to pull the trigger on a play, but at that point, way too far behind, and they just can't defend the base. Yeah, very difficult stuff there for Legacy once they were behind, but for the side of Mineski, that's all it's about right now. They looked very clean, surprisingly so. And again, they are the third seed of the Southeast Asian region, maybe is the best team that they have. And you said they played day one, they looked great, however, had to sit out the whole of day two, had to watch their region nearly fall down. And they come in on this day three, once again, as a coordinated unit, without that hesitation, and absolutely body legacy. And without hesitation, that is the Southeast Asian style we've been seeing for years at these inter-region, at these international wildcard events. They are a scrappy team. They can get those skirmishes. And against Legacy, the pressure in the early game was just too much. And I like the draft. I like the cohesion there. As you mentioned, Rusty, Legacy's draft seemed to be about a little bit backwards in some regards. However, Mineski's draft made a lot of sense. Yeah, I do think Mineski's draft was very cohesive and did look brilliant together, and you're right. For the side of Legacy, I think there were some drafting changes that absolutely could have been made. The blind pick of the Mundo is the first one. Now they know Mineski can play that Aatrox. That will help coming into the final day when they play against them. Perhaps that will change for them and they get that opportunity. And this is the first time that Southeast Asia has beaten Oceania, and we're seeing a recipe as to how they did it. Yeah, and it's kind of funny that Legacy do draft this style, I feel like, pretty often, where they have these tools. If they get ahead, they can take over the game, but unfortunately for them, this time they didn't have access to Wave Clear. Claire had a very good Zoe game yesterday. Unfortunately here, shut down on the LeBlanc. The counter pick was not enough, and they just fall down. Yeah, and I mean, just some questionable, de questionable decision-making from the young members of Legacy, but I think at the same time, you have to applaud the ability to punish that. You know, mm -hmm. Raptor Camp invades when Exosen should have been going back, but because he was on vision, able to take down only a couple of times. Yeah, I ultimately do think it was very greedy from the Legacy side, pushing for things they shouldn't have, but the punish was fantastic. And even before that punish, making the proactive plays was something that Mineski did very impressive. And we talked about timing so often, but that was like a pre-level six bootless fiddlesticks that's running up the river, like getting picks, things like that, that were just so proactive.
proactive so early into the game and kind of forcing errors that Legacy had to make. Yeah, it certainly was. So unfortunately, Oast cannot come through for the LJ Allen. It is going to be Mineski securing Southeast Asia's spot in tomorrow's grand final. Don't go anywhere, guys. After the break, we have more Rift Rivals action.